Our gracious God in heaven, we thank you for this Lord's Day. And we thank you that we, your people, can gather together. And even before we assemble in worship, that we can take this time to study what we believe and why we believe it. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us and direct us. May what we look at be faithful to your word. And may you give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see your truths as we study the doctrines of your church today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to, as I said by way of introduction, I want to begin even more basic than giving you a history lesson on the Heidelberg Catechism, as much as I want to do that. Uh, but I want to go back and I want to begin uh, at a more basic level and ask this question, what is... A catechism. What is a catechism? When you hear the word catechism, what do you think of? Maybe, let me back up and say this. Maybe this will be a little more fun. The first time you heard the word catechism, what did you think? Catholic Church. I've had actually several folks say, well, isn't that a, a Catholic thing? And I get the, the pleasure of saying, nope. Yeah. What else? What else sprung to mind when you heard the word catechism? Lifelong Presbyterians do not get to answer this or participate in this survey. Boring. Yes. Okay. Boring. Boring. Roman Catholic. Boring. A split. What? Teaching. Sure, the teaching. We might think of the word catechesis, right? Which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. What else? Huh? Memory work. Do what now? Memory work. <laughs> Memory work. Ah, you had to memorize the catechism growing up. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I, I'm so this is just to, I'm just curious. How many here today? grew up memorizing the Shorter Catechism as a child? One, two, three, four, four. I mean, that's, that's still amongst us. That's a, that's a pretty, pretty good number. Uh, I think many of you know that in, in the traditional uh, Presbyterian heritage, um, every child would have been taught all 107 questions and answers of the Shorter Catechism and would have, have, that would have been part of their, their teaching and training within the, in the church. And uh, many traditional, lifelong Presbyterians uh, to this day, if you ask them one of the questions, they may not know it verbatim, but they can get it pretty, pretty close. So that, that's pretty neat. Um, so Sam will be quizzing you after Sunday school today. So. Uh, uh, question 105. No. Yeah, the first one, yeah. You know, that's what I've said. You know, we're encouraging the, the church to, to memorize through the Westminster Shorter Catechism this year. And I've given us a rather aggressive schedule, which is my nature. And, um, and to memorize through the, the catechism in a year, it, 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 is, it will require some work. And we're not used to that as Americans or as moderns, are we? Uh, so we've got to knuckle down a little bit to, to, to accomplish that. And, and Sydney said, don't you think that's a little bit of an aggressive pace? And I, and I said, well, look, here's the deal. If the church just memorized the first four, like that's a win. Because it's four more or at least three more. Most of you, I think, have the first one uh, memorized. Uh, but that's a win, I think. And so if we get to the end of the year, out of 107 questions, and the church has memorized, well, 107, but didn't accomplish that and got 15. Well, wouldn't that be wonderful? But I digress. Um, so many of us have, have hear the word catechism and we think different things either back from our past or maybe just a lack of understanding. But the word catechism comes from the ancient word, the ancient Greek word katechine. And what the word literally meant was to instruct orally. And you can certainly think about this from the standpoint of an era where most of the population was not literate then the teaching that would happen within the home 
our teaching within the church and so forth would be to ask a question and to teach the, the responder to respond orally. So it would be this teaching uh, orally. And so a catechism from the very earliest times meant a pedagogical tool. And that was certainly the case in New Testament history. In New Testament history, we see that some form of oral instruction was taking place as a pedagogical tool to, and for those of you that know your church history, uh, know that, that this is where we get our word catechumens, um, which interestingly enough, I found that many people hear that word and for some reason think of a, a cemetery or a place of dead people. Um, but the, the reason why uh, we get that is, is, is many times the early church was having to meet in, well, less desirable locations, but catechumen actually is the one being instructed, the one who is learning orally the truths of Christ's church. And in the early church, we have evidence that there were catechumens who would be trained in this oral education uh, prior to their baptism, if they were adults, or if they had been baptized as infants, they would be catechumens being trained in preparation for communion, uh, for the Lord's Supper. And so eventually within the church, they became training books uh, used to eventually uh, become what is a modern catechism. And uh, typically, those those training, that training would be done in question and answer. Such training and structure follows the example of Scripture. Let me give you an example. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 14, Moses says this to Israel, And when in time to come your son asks you, What does this mean? You shall say to him, By a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of of slavery. And so we see early in Israel's redeemed history, we see the example of a question and answer. And interestingly enough, one of the best places for catechisms to be learned is within the home. You see here in this example, when your son or when your child asks you, kids have questions, don't they? They have questions just naturally. How wonderful would it be for us to teach our children and our grandchildren to ask really good questions like, what is the chief of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. How beautiful is that? Or to ask a simple question, what is God? And to be able to teach them the answer, God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable and in His being, wisdom, power, justice, holiness, goodness, and truth. To be able to have a child to be able to respond with that kind of answer, imagine what a rich heritage you would be bestowing upon them. In the early church, there are New Testament examples of catechisms. For example, uh, Cyril of Jerusalem uh, had his catechetical or catechetical lectures. Uh, Gregory of Nyssa had his catechetical oration. And Augusta in the 4th century, in the 5th century rather, uh, had his on the catechizing of the uninstructed and another publication as well, what we would call publication or writing as well. And so following that structure, following that tradition, we get in the church the example of training the young and the uneducated in this way. And by the way, I would consider myself uneducated in this sense, so I'll throw myself in there with the young. I need to learn catechisms as well. Early on in the church, catechisms focused on, and this is following Augustine's tradition, they focused on the Ten Commandments, on the Lord's Prayer, and on the Apostles' Creed. Now, some of you who are students of history know when Luther came upon the picture and Luther had his own catechism, he changed that structure a little bit because Luther, as you know, was obsessed with the difference between law and gospel. And so in his catechism, you see a, a very distinct divide between law and, and gospel. But in early church history, we don't necessarily see that distinct divide. But if you think about it today, 
most of you, at least if you have been at this church for a relatively short amount of time, you will at least know the Lord's Prayer and you'll know the Apostles' Creed by memory. I mean, think about that. If you wonder why your pastor at times can seem like a broken record, there's madness behind it. I mean, intentionally repeating things within our liturgy, some of you now can, say, can stand up and you don't even need to look at the screen. I believe in God the Father. You know this by, by memory. You know the Lord's uh, Prayer, at least the King James Version that we use in our liturgy by memory. And I would imagine uh, many of you, if not all of you, also know the Ten Commandments. So you're going to expect some of that to be incorporated into the church's catechisms and you're definitely going to see it in our study of the Heidelberg Catechisms. Now, if you move forward in church history, there were also catechism examples within the Middle Ages, but it's really in the Reformation that we see sort of a renewal, or, or what I would call a zeal, for catechizing the young and the uneducated. And Luther, as I said, is a prime example of this. Uh, Luther, within his lifetime, produced at least two well-used catechisms. <clears throat> and for those of you that are in education, you'll also find this very interesting. Um, Luther, and I might even say Reformation education, which was remarkably successful in, in teaching and training children, emphasized repetition and memorization, believe it or not. Two of the things that are often missing in modern education, uh, but in the Reformation there was a heavy emphasis upon repetition and memorization. Well, you can think about how catechisms would really play into that kind of structure because what you're teaching and what we're learning is to memorize it and then to repeat it. And the more we repeat it, the more it is placed in our memory. Uh, one of the, the great Presbyterian stories is of B.B. Warfield, that great theologian of Princeton. And it said, uh, and I believe, although my history may be wrong, I believe it was during the Civil War uh, that he encountered another man. And I believe he heard the man speak. And the rest of the story I know is, is accurate. And in that, Warfield went, you're a catechism man. He heard a certain structure and he knew by virtue of the way in which that man's mind and repetitive thought processes and verbiage was, ah, that's a guy that grew up memorizing the shorter catechism. And in fact, true story, the guy did grow up learning the Shorter Catechism. So it's kind of a neat, a neat story in that. But all of that coming out of the Reformation, really we see the standard for the Reformed Church. Not the Lutheran Church, but for the Reformed Church, the standard really came from John Calvin. Um, Calvin wrote his first Genevan Catechism uh, and published it in 1537. It was then later revised in 1542. So those of you that are doing the mental math right now, you know that Luther nailed his uh, theses upon the Wittenberg Castle door 1517, right? October 31st. Hallows' Eve, 1517. So by 1537, Calvin's in Geneva publishing catechisms for the Reformed Church. By 1542, he has a revised version that is used and became the standard pretty much from 1543, I mean 1542, until 1563. So that's a, that's a pretty good period. And, and as many of you know from your studies of church history, Geneva was sort of the missionary uh, uh, base for sending out and the reformed, reforming of the church within uh, the West, in Western Europe. And so at that time, that catechism is going out with those missionaries, with those what we would call today church planters, uh, but really reformers uh, going out. And that was really the standard. So what happened in 1563? That's, that's the question that we need uh, to ask. Now, before I answer that question, I want to read to you this great quote. So... If you, if you know uh, English history, you know that King Edward VI 
came to the throne before he was old enough. And so he had, uh, an, an, a, a, I've forgotten now, a protector, I think is what they called them, who was sort of his guardian until he was of age. And interestingly enough, Calvin, who was concerned with reforming the reformation of the church, not only in Switzerland where he was based, but of course in France, but also in England and so forth and so on. So he pins a letter to Edward Seymour, who was the protector of King Edward VI. And in his letter, he talks about, and I kid you not, the necessity of catechisms and catechizing the young. He writes this, 1548. There is an importance for a formula of instruction for little children and for ignorant persons, serving to make them familiar with sound doctrine so that they may be able to discern the difference between it and falsehood and corruptions which may be brought forward in opposition to it. And what Calvin is saying there is, I cannot cover all of the different things that you are going to encounter that are contrary to Scripture. I've even been asked in, in this class, why don't you just pick something and tell us the difference between it and the Reformed theology that we believe? And my answer to that is, it's a moving target. I can't tell you all of the error because error has been in existence since the fall. And it will continue to be. And it will propagate. So what do you do? You learn the truth. It's like the old example, I have no idea if this is still true. Someone in banking can probably tell me. But is it, is it still true that the best way to be able to tell a real $100 bill from a counterfeit dollar bill is to know very well a real $100 bill? I don't know if that's the case still, but it was. And that's why instead of trying to go out and chase, you know, so what does the evangelical movement at this time believe compared to the Reformed tradition? What do Roman Catholics believe compared to the Reformed tradition? What do, insert whatever you want to. If we are to do that, we'll never finish. But if we will know what we believe, then we will be able to examine everything else according to that standard. And that's what Calvin is saying, is if you want your children to know the truth, teach them the truth, and they'll be able to spot the error. So, why study a catechism? Why study a catechism today, in 2024? Number one, for the necessity of instruction. The necessity of instruction. And again, at this, the sake of being redundant, the point that Calvin made remains true. If you want to know what error is, if you want to know where, for example, the modern American church has strayed, then you need to know first what the truth is and what we believe to be the truth. In Luke chapter 1, and I know all of you know this introduction, Luke writes, "...inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also." having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Not will be taught, not can be taught, but have been taught. And in studying that, what I find interesting is, is that word taught is that same great Greek word, catechine that I explained to you at the very beginning, that oral teaching. In other words, what Luke is saying is, I know that you have been instructed. Before you get this letter from me, I know that you have been taught. His education had begun previously 
And so now Luke is coming along then to confirm and to reiterate that. In addition to that, the necessity of instruction uses a tool. So, for example, you might say, you know, well, I, I remember growing up in a church when they said, uh, we, 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 we ain't got no, because I can't use proper English when I say this, we ain't got no creed but the Bible. We ain't got no confession but the Bible. We ain't got no catechisms. And they, I'm, again, I'm, I'm being facetious. They probably used proper English when they said that. But the point is, is that you probably heard that. And the reality is, is that if you read the Bible and yet you don't have a framework of interpretation, you don't have what we would call in seminary a hermeneutic, an interpretive framework to interpret the Bible, well, as you and I know, you can come up with all kinds of things that contradict one another, that lead off in a myriad of, of directions of error and so forth and so on. And so there is the necessity to instruct, and we need to use the best tools that we can. And a great tool that has been used since before the early New Testament church is catechesis, to learn by this oral instruction or by a catechism. And so we would think of this as the use of a tool. The use of a pedagogical tool. I have heard the allegation, you know, well, you, you Presbyterians, uh, you treat the Westminster Confession like it's the Bible. No, we don't. In fact, our confession says it's not and we shall not treat it like the Bible. It is a subordinate standard. I've heard people say, you know, well, kids learning and memorizing the Shorter Catechism, they should be learning Scripture. Hey, teach your kids Scripture. Teach them to learn and memorize the Word of God. It will be read and preached from this church. But in order to help them know the Scripture that they memorize, teach them to learn a catechism. Because it's a good pedagogical tool. It's a great way to teach them how to think and how to learn. What the catechism teaches us should direct us to the Bible. It should teach us. One of the wonderful things that I have learned about memorizing the Shorter Catechism, I've told you before, I'm out for my, my walk, and I've got the dog who now is also learning the catechisms with me. And, uh, and I'm, 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 you know, I'll say them out loud because nobody else is around me at 6.30 in the morning. And I'm, I'm saying them, the catechisms out loud, and I'll stop, and I'll think, oh, wow. Oh, wow. That takes about five Bible verses that I know for a fact and succinctly states them in about four words. Wow. Wow. It's directing me back to the Word of God as it should be. Uh, secondly, and I love the way that G.I. Williamson puts this. G.I. Williamson says that if you're struggling with a use of a catechism, you need to think of catechism as a map. It's a really good map. Because someone might say, why bother to study a map? Why not just go out and study the surface of the earth instead? Well, you, you, you might find the, the feel of a rock and the sand or the grass or the water, but you're going to really have a hard time getting across that earth to any place that you might want to go. You have to have a map to help you go across the earth. And so catechisms help us like a map. Furthermore, Williamson says, catechisms are the product of many centuries of Bible study by a great company of believers. They are a kind of spiritual road map of the teaching of the Bible already worked out and proved by others before us. In other words, what Williamson is saying is, is as moderns, we think very highly of ourselves, despite the fact that that perhaps, at least in modern history, there were the most biblically illiterate and theologically illiterate Christians in recent history. And yet, we tend to think, you know, oh, well, I, I, I don't need that, or whatever the case is, and we forget 
the benefit of drawing from the wisdom that has gone, come before us. This is typically my response when somebody wants to, to pick a fight with me over the Westminster Confession or the catechisms. And, and I, I simply say, don't you find it fascinating that since the mid-1600s, Reformed English speakers have subscribed to this confession and to these catechisms without exception since the mid-1600s. It's 2024. And in 2024, as a minister of this church, I subscribe to the exact same, with the exception of the confession, which has a few adjustments for living in the United States of America, I subscribe to that same standard of doctrine. And so we're drawing from those who have gone before us, those who were richly steeped in Scripture, those who did work out these difficult doctrines and stated them so well for us. All right, so with the time I have left, because actually the history of the Heidelberg Catechism is quite short, I want to ask, I want to discuss the what the why, the when, and the who of the Heidelberg Catechism. So what is the Heidelberg Catechism? The Heidelberg Catechism is a catechism that was drafted at the order of Elector Frederick III, who ruled over the Palatinate region of Germany. Now, I don't know... My German, I don't know German history at all, actually, uh, but the little bit of study that I did on this, it was a region of what was then the German Empire. So it was a region of Germany, and the, the ruler, or as he was referred to, the elector over this region was Frederick III. Now, Frederick, who had previously been a Roman Catholic, when he began to read the Reformation writings, and especially when he came under the influence of Calvin's writings, he was like, wow, this is the truth. It directed him to Scripture. He saw the Christian truth of that. And so, in governing his region in the capital of that Palatinate region, the capital being Heidelberg, he said... I have a concern for the Protestants of under my domain. And I want to make sure that they, in fact, have a good, well-written statement of what we believe in the Reformed Church. And there were three things that were Frederick's goal. So this is the why. Why, why was uh, the Heidelberg Catechism written? Actually, let me back up in just a second. One other thing that I think you ought to know about the Heidelberg Catechism is it is structured into 129 questions. You don't have to remember that, but you do want to remember this. And 52 sections. It wasn't originally. They came back and revised it a little bit later. But it's structured into 52 sections. Now, when I say the word 52, what does that make you think of? Weeks in the year. So there are in the Heidelberg Catechisms, 52 Lord's Days. And so the way it's structured is it will say questions as pertinent to Lord's Day 1, Lord's Day 2, Lord's Day 3, so forth and so on. And so beginning the first day of the week with that catechetical instruction. Frederick had three goals, and this is important. And you say, what in the world, why is this important for me today when I don't live in the Platinum of Germany? Well, here's why. Number one, he wanted to provide a catechetical tool for teaching the young. Now, that's an admirable goal. I mean, I, I would think, you know, in the church, that's, that's something we would want. We would want our children to learn by virtue of a long, tried, and true history of teaching. We'd want our young to know. So number one, a catechetical tool to teach the young. Number two, to provide a doctrinal guide for teaching in the church. And this is one of the things that is so brilliant about the Heidelberg Catechism that you don't see, for example, in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which is inter interestingly enough, which is why we have another catechism called the Larger. But the Heidelberg Catechism is not just a catechism to be learned by the young, it also is to be used as a statement of doctrine for the church. 
And so the Reformed church at that time would have been reading this and they would go, Aha! This is a clear statement of what we believe. As I've said before, you want to know what we believe? You come to me, i got questions about what y'all believe. Okay, here it is. Well, that's what the church could do at that time by virtue of the Heidelberg Catechism. And his third goal, so first goal was to have a catechetical tool for the young. Second goal was a doctrinal guide for the church. And then third was to provide a confessional unity for Protestants under, in, within his state. So within the, the, that Palatinate state, he wanted to be able to have a unity for the confessional church to be able to say, this is what we believe. That too is a beautiful thing. And so Frederick wrote this in his first publication. This is in the preface, I might add, from the very first edition, 1563. That's, by the way, what happened in 1563. This was published. Frederick writes... We have had prepared and compiled in both German and Latin a concise booklet of instruction or catechism of our Christian religion extracted from the Word of God. This was done so that in the future not only will our young people be instructed in the Christian doctrine in a godly manner and admonished in unanimity, but also so that pastors and school teachers themselves will have a reliable model and a solid standard. But that, that is, they, I'm somewhat marvel that that's the ruler of that state at that time actually wrote that. But what an admirable desire, right? That's our desire, and he concludes with, well, he concludes with people like me. Now, I, I'm, I'm a minister of the gospel. I'm also a Presbyterian minister in, in the, the, uh, reform, you know, the long-standing Reformed tradition of our church. And, and I subscribe to not only our confessional standards, but so also to those other confessions and catechisms in our Reformed tradition, which all, by the way, fits together like hand and glove, which is why we as a church are studying this, a Germanic catechism that had a profound impact on the Reformed Church of its day. All right, when? When was the Heidelberg Catechism published? It was published January 19, 1563. And so today, if you think about this, 450 years later, I actually, we'll just ask this. Does anybody know what churches still today 2024, still use the Heidelberg Catechism as their standard of doctrine. Dutch Reformed Church, to this day, still that is their subordinate standard. What else? In addition to the Dutch Reformed, we'll, we'll get to, if we have time later, the whole reason why the Dutch got in on the German movement, right? Yeah. So also the German Reformed Church... And so also variations of that. So, for example, if I know some of you are, are fans of, of Mike Horton, Michael Horton at Westminster in California, and, uh, and Mike and, and Kim Riddlebogger, if you've ever read his book on the case for amillennialism, uh, Kim and Mike and all those guys sort of in that, that little group of White Horse Inn, uh, they all belong to an American church of which its standard of doctrine includes the three forms of unity, one of which is, uh, within that three, is the Heidelberg Catechism. So, who wrote the Heidelberg Catechism? Many of you will have heard the name before, but Zacharias Ursinus um, is probably the one who wrote all or most of the Heidelberg Catechism. It was commissioned by Frederick III, uh, he engaged another theologian at Heidelberg University called Caspar uh, Olivianus, maybe? Anybody know how to pronounce his name? No? Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to guess that it was Olivianus. And if I'm wrong, sorry. Uh, but so also Zacharias Ursinus. And uh, today, scholars who have looked at other writings by Ursinus say he probably wrote all of it. Uh, based on the, uh, his writing style and, and so forth. So, in conclusion, why study the Heidelberg Catechism? Not only the fact that it was written 
for things of which we could agree in, on, re agree on, not only because it had a profound impact on the Western Reformed Church, not only because it influenced so also the Westminster Assembly and in, in our standard of doctrine today, but I just want to read to you the first question and answer because it is brilliant. Listen to this. Question, what is your only comfort in life and death? <laughs> Who doesn't want to know that? All of us, every human being for that matter. What is your only comfort in life and death? Listen to this answer. That I, with, <laughs> whew, it's so good, I, I'm going to try to hold my composure and read it all. That I, with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with His precious blood has fully satisfied for all my sins and delivered me from all the power of the devil and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation. Wherefore, by His Holy Spirit, He also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready henceforth to live unto Him. Mic drop. That's what we're going to study. Let me pray for us. Lord, you know I don't have the words to state better the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our only comfort in life in death. But oh Lord, we thank you for those who have gone before us. For those who have wrestled with Scripture and the difficult doctrines of your word, and so beautifully have stated, often succinctly, yet superbly, what we believe as Christians. Now, Lord, we know that your word is inerrant, not catechisms or confessions or creeds. And we confess that your word is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and yet... By your Holy Spirit, you have used the means of man to deliver to your church catechisms and creeds and confessions to teach us. And so we pray that we would listen. And we would pray in our modern era of intellectual arrogance that we would humble ourselves and so be taught by our teachers who have studied and gone before us. And now we pray that based on the truths in this beautiful answer, that we now would go forth to worship together as your church, not based on our merits, nor based on even our studies, but rather based only on the finished work of Jesus Christ our Lord. And we pray that as we assemble in worship today, that your Holy Spirit would not only be present, but would show us Christ. Him crucified and resurrected, that we would say we have indeed met with God in our worship of you. We pray this dependently. We pray this pleading. In Jesus' name, amen.